Well, the wall is out of the way. Everybody is sitting. No, not everybody is sitting down, but maybe they could sit down so we can make a start. It is lightning talks time. This is my favorite part of PyCon. Um, we have currently at least nine talks today on various topics. They'll go for about five minutes. Now, if you've not seen lightning talks before, we like to keep a really tight ship. So there is a timer. It's sitting on this lectern here. And you people in the middle will see when it is starting to hit zero. When it gets close to hitting zero, I need you to applause and make it impossible for everyone else in the audience to hear the person on stage. So can we get a practice for this? Great, I can't hear myself. So this is working really well. Don't stop. Great, that means we can keep a tight ship because you will stop applauding once the person has stopped speaking, which is great. So, our first presenter is Marcus Holterman, who is going to be telling us all about Django Login Canary. Please make him welcome and start the timer. So, yeah, um, what I was... <laughs> Keep talking. Okay. Um, doing... I have plenty of time. <laughs> During writing my master thesis over the last couple of months, I had some time, apparently. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it uh, next to my time as a Django core contributor. And I wrote a small library where you can get notified if your users are lo or where your users get notified if somebody tries lo to log in uh, on their account or somebody fails to, to log in. It's called Django Login Canary. And what you can do is, this is an example project. Um, when you go to localhost, you log in, and when it works, you see that you get an email that tells you everything is fine. So what happens if you log out, there's a button over there, and you try to log in again, and you type a wrong password? Well, of course, this doesn't work, but you also get a not notification, well, tr somebody tried but failed. Well, of course, if you supply a wrong username, and it, of course, doesn't work, but you also don't get, there's no message sent. Okay, that's all. Okay, so up next on the other side, we have Tim Ansell. On deck over this side, we have a Russell Keith McGee. Uh, let's start Tim, who apparently still has too many projects. Ah. That's on the wrong screen. Yes, I do. And I'm running out of time. This one again. Um, so last year I gave this talk, and I'm giving it again. Um, and I'm over here for all the people still looking in that direction. Um, so yeah, I need really to sleep. So I could really use some help on these projects. Um, there are things to hack on during the sprints if you're around. Um, I'm quite happy for you to hack on them anytime, not just the sprints. Um, the first thing is if you're using um, dates in Python, you should care about time zones. And so this is a library which deeply cares about time zones and is a drop-in replacement and gives you a whole bunch of extra functionality to kind of coerce people who don't really understand time zones sort of thing. Um, now, it has Python 3 support, so if that's been stopping you, you can use it on Python 3. It also has Windows support, so if you're using Windows for some reason I can't fathom, um, you can now get proper time zone support with Python date time TZ. Um, who here knows what Q is? Um, I'm not seeing many people, so I'm going to stop here for a little bit. Um, it's basically quick and dirty debugging output for tired programmers. It's basically a fancier print statement. Um, I didn't write it. Um, a really wonderful person wrote it. Um, you basically import Q, then like you can queue something, and it goes to a log file and temp queue. You can at queue a function that gives you like um, the inputs and the return arguments from it. Um, I took up maintainership for it because it wasn't being maintained, and it now has Python 3 support too, so you can use that on Python 3, and it has tests. 
Um, I'm also working on Tim's videos, um, which is a bunch of projects, and there's lots and lots of Python. Um, so this is the HDMI to USB. It's a capture solution for um, conferences like this to capture video, and I'm trying to see how much time I've got. Uh, plenty of time. Um, this is kind of cool because it's a piece of open source hardware, um, and you're probably wondering why I'm talking about this at a Python conference. Um, we now have Python-based firmware for this video recording device, and it's on a thing called MeGen, so you still need to know some stuff about hardware, but instead of writing horrible Verilog or VHDL, which is um, an absolutely atrocious languages, you can write Python, and it actually works pretty well. Um, so we now have a firmware that's in Python that you can help out with. Um, we also have a piece of open hardware. This is something I've been working on for the last um, two years. It's called the Numantu Opus, and it's basically fully open, schematic, firmware, PCB, and you'll be able to buy one soon. Um, so you can go to bit.ly get opus, and we'll email you when you can buy one, and you have full access to all the um, information about it. It's all open. Um, as well, there's a lot more going on. Um, SlideLint is another one. Um, I've seen a lot of atrocious slides at this conference with fonts that are like this big. Um, I can't read that even when sitting in the front row, so you should use SlideLint. SlideLint tells you about all the problems you have in your slides. <laughs> um, so this is kind of the slides lint run on my own slides. Um, we have a website version One now, so you minute. don't even have to run it on the command line. Um, we would love help making this website less bad. Um, <laughs> so, yes, we would love, and it's all written in Python, and you can kind of see that um, my own slides don't validate. So, I'd love help with that. Uh, that's all where you can get code and stuff. Um, there's plenty of other things, like um, it was developed by a non-English speaker, so the English isn't even that great, um, which is kind of bad on something that's telling you your English isn't great. Um, <laughs> so, we'd love help with that. Um, we also have a live video mixing software. Um, it has a very strong Python API, and there's also a fully Python version. Again, Python, Python, Python. Streaming system, lots more. Um, please help me, I need to click. Right, stop, 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 stop. great, okay. Um, I've been coming to PyCon AU for six years now, and Tim has given this talk at five as well as like the last ten LCAs. Please work on his project so he can stop giving this damn lightning talk and wasting our time with it. Uh, up next, oh, on deck, so we have Stephen Joseph. Can you go and set up over there? And up next, we have another bloody academic wanting to tell us about his titles. Please make him welcome. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, I am a 10-year veteran of the, Django, of the Django core team. I am a member of the Django Technical Advisory Board, and I am president of the Django Software Foundation. I am the founder of the Beware Project, a project looking at the tools we use to develop Python. A uh, big part of Beware is Toga, a cross-platform widget toolkit that allows you to build native iOS and Android applications in Python. Beware and Toga are both works in progress, but if you're interested in Python development tools or Python on mobile, come and have a chat with me. I'm also a CTO, a co-founder of a startup company, uh, with all the pressures and stresses that come along with that. And I'm also a doctor. I'm not that kind of doctor. Um, my doctorate is in computer science. My doctoral thesis was entitled Models of Learning and Development in Cajonan-style Self-Organizing Feature Maps. <laughs> the reason I say this is no, I'm not a, not a medical doctor is because this is not medical advice. It's personal anecdote. But I hope that by sharing, I encourage other people to do something that I didn't do for a very long time. You may have noticed I have my fingers in a lot of pies. Uh, I've got a stressful job, I volunteer with Django, I've got side projects, I also have a son with learning difficulties and a daughter and a wife, and over the last few years, the combination of these stresses really started to take its toll. My temper started to get short, I found myself getting frustrated, both with myself and with others. I found myself doubting my own abilities, not just imposter syndrome level stuff either, a genuine belief that I was incompetent. 
My enthusiasm to go out and socialise with friends was reduced. Picking up the phone to organise to go with a friend to go over for dinner or to go out for dinner just felt like too much effort. And I had some intermittent health problems, especially with my back and shoulder. It wasn't constant. And it wasn't a continuous decline. I had good days, I had bad days, I had good weeks, I had bad weeks. But this pattern has been going on for about 18 months. But in about mid-March, I hit rock bottom. I woke up one Wednesday morning, went into my office, started work, and by about 9.30 in the morning, I could not, I didn't have any, any energy to continue. I couldn't summon the energy to give a damn about anything. I went back to my bed, I buried my head in my pillow, and I cried. That was the final straw for my wife. Uh, she pushed me out the door to go see a doctor, a medical one, and I was diagnosed as being in the middle of a major depressive episode. I'm being treated now. I'm at the start of my treatment, so it's, a, no, it's, it's way too early to declare the victory, but even in this short time, I've noticed a positive change in myself. At some level, it's probably just the cathartic release of knowing that what I was feeling wasn't right and it can be treated, but frankly, I'd take any improvement I can get. The reason I'm going public about this is because, in retrospect, I put off getting help for far too long. I didn't want to admit failure. I didn't want to attract the stigma of admitting that I was mentally ill. Successful people don't get depressed. Successful people power through. Successful people win. And it's bull. <laughs> Studies universally agree that depression affects at least one in ten people in our general population. It's higher in some demographics. Our industry is particularly prone to the tune that discussions about burnout are an almost constant undertone. I want every single person in this room to know that you're not alone. I am, by almost every conceivable public measure, a successful member of this community, and I have depression. My plea to every single one of you, don't ignore the signs. Don't put off getting help. If you've even got a vague feeling you might be depressed or suffering from burnout, Seek help, because you don't have to feel like this. Denying you have a problem won't make anything better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russell. That was a, a deeply important message, and thank you so much for sharing your story, Russell. That was fantastic. Um, it is great to hear that you are getting help. Um, now, on deck over this side, we have Chris uh, Beaven. Beaven. Beaver? Beaven, great. Okay, so on this side, we have Stephen Joseph, who has the longest talk title, apparently about async IO TLDR edition. I'm trying to fit a full-length talk into five minutes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Let's make a start. Yep, start the timer. <laughs> No. <laughs> There's always at least one of these. Does anybody else have a music anecdote to share? We're ready. To <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Shall we restart his timer? Or no? Oh! Oh! Yes, okay. Your time starts now. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm going to...
just go through it. So C10K problem, uh, don't panic. <laughs> Basically, I've got a lot of memes in there, so it should be fun. Um, so C10K problem refers to the problem of optimizing network sockets to handle a large number of clients at the same time. OK? <laughs> yeah, it can get really messy. Uh, concurrency versus parallelism. Concurrency is dealing about a lot of things at the same uh, uh, things at once. Parallelism, parallelism is about doing a lot of things at once. There's a difference. Subtle, yes. But look into it. <laughs> Achieving concurrency in pop Python. There are two popular ways. One is G-event, event, um, event-led, green-led. And then there's asynchronous code, via, uh, like Twisted, Async.io, and Tornado. Yeah, there are two things. Uh, most popular one is, of course, G-event. So what's the problem with G-event? OK, so why bother? We have G-event. Everything's good. Unicorns, everything. Good, great. <laughs> but in, it involves monkey patching. So, <laughs> so this is what happened. This, this is somewhere on the, uh, in, in somewhere on the interwebs. Uh, some, some guy asked Guido, uh, what's the problem with uh, using, exp uh, why do you want to use explicit deals over coroutines? Guido says, I'm very fond of G-events. Uh, I'm not very fond of G-events, not because of monkey, monkey patching or the, and the machine level hackery. But also, you could end up having a possibility of task switches happening in, uh, at random times, basically. So he says, um, well, implicit yield approach may be a problem in theory. And then Guido says, yes, but I really don't want to go into the details. Trust me, I have a big scar somewhere. OK? And then Glyph adds in, Glyph from Twisted, he adds in, they work up, up to the moment, they don't. And I don't want to talk about either. <laughs> so TLDR, spooky action at a distance. That's a quantum mechanics reference. You can look it up. <laughs> so basically, that's the direction we're going. The BDFL wants to go with Python. Um, explicit versus implicit concurrency. It's an iceberg. <laughs> so explicit concurrency, a programming model based on explicit cooperative multithreading, wherein yield points are visibly lo visible locally. That means you explicitly say, this is where you yield. Um, uh, yeah, it's too big. <laughs> <laughs> so implicit con concurrency with G-Event, it wasn't supported until Python 3. Uh, I didn't know about it until today morning, so yeah. Um, so now, uh, recently, they've added support for Python 3 in G-Event, so yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, with coroutines, you probably have callbacks <laughs> with new callbacks. Um, so explicit concurrency with callbacks is explicit, so you say, uh, what am I? Oh, this is this is like explicitly you're saying you're giving a function that will be called back uh, when 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 data is available on the socket or whatever. Um, explicit concurrency using pep 380, the yield from statement, it makes it a lot nicer. So you can do a yield from which is basically a generator which yields from a generator internally. I'll go into that later on. But basically, this is how it looked like. Good was happy. <laughs> So a few implementations of the, the I.O. loop, which are out there already. Twisted, Tornado, ZMQ, loopy doo loop is not exactly an implementation. <laughs> <laughs> so Guido shared his thoughts, starting with, this is an incredibly important discussion. So yeah, incredibly important discussion. Uh, so, so the included one uh, in async core is not up to the mark, he's saying, in Python 2.7, I think, uh, and later on. Um, so we've got to do something about it. So leading up to Python 3, uh, PEP 3156, uh, I think I think I will support uh, reboot it. So this is an awesome module. You should look into it. Um, One minute. <laughs> okay. Um, so advantages of using that uh, would be <laughs> so it's pure Python 3.3. Um, I mean, uh, probably available in later versions also, but it's pure Python. Uh, the reference implementation is Tulip. No third-party modules, no C code. Uh, so you should be able to run it on any Python. So, uh, should, <laughs> Python 3. Um, so the event loop in, in, in Async.io can be put into Tornado. It can be put into uh, Twisted. So it's supposed to be completely uh, interoperable. So uh, you, should be, you shouldn't have issues integrating into any, any libraries. Um, and it gives you a lot of other new Things, but anyway, yield from pet 380, Shakespeare reference. <laughs> it's actually so, get off the stage. Come on. Come oh, on, okay. you've had your time. I'm done. I'm done.
<laughs> so I take it there's a version of that talk uh, where we can actually hear all of the, uh, all the things that you're going to read off the slides somewhere on the internet. <laughs> There's a 30 minute version of it somewhere? Yeah, this is the 30 minute version of it. I'm trying to last through it. <laughs> okay, so uh, over on deck we have uh, Zhuang Yi Shu, and over here we have, speaking about bit ID authentication, Chris Beaven. Your time starts now. Hello, I'm Chris Beaven, uh, Smiley Chris on IRC Django's channel, if you've. If you've uh, frequent that. So I'm going to talk about bit ID authentication. Now, I'm quite involved in the Bitcoin community, and so this is something that's come out of that. Bit, bit ID is a open protocol allowing simple and secure authentication using public key cryptography, and the cryptography that it's using is Bitcoin's um, elliptic curves. Uh, it really just uses a Bitcoin wallet to sign, to sign cryptographic, you know, one, in once cryptographic and Send that back to somewhere. I'll, sh I'll show you what it looks like later. <laughs> so this is what a, what a standard uh, registration form might look like. You've got your emails, and you've got some other stuff, and you've got to put in a password, and you've got to put it in again. Um, so rather than filling in that, um, BitID would give you something where you just scan this on your phone. Um, so what this gives you is, um, if you used it this way, is that you'd have an ID that was just, site, was just your public address, it would be a unique address for every site, so there's no cross-site um, issues there of people stealing your data and sharing it around, and there's no passwords, yay. So um, let's show how it works. Um, so first of all, the server provides a cryptographic URL, and so that's got an in once in it that um, is only ever used once, and, and that um, is displayed in the form of a QR code, and then you'll the user will grab out their Bitcoin client, so they usually you'll use a, a mobile wallet because then you can scan the QR code, but there are ways around signing it manually. And so they will generate a unique address. Um, well, yeah, they, they generate a unique address based on the domain. And so based on that, they can um, post a signed response back using this unique Bitcoin address that they've created, and that goes to the callback URL and um, then you can use JavaScript and stuff like that to, to try it out. So now I'm going to see if this will actually work. Oh. <laughs> Roughly. Let's try it out. OK, so we've got our, there's a bit ID, and I'll get out my, this is always the fun bit, nobody used the internet for a second. <laughs> <laughs> So, for example, I'd just come along, see if I can scan this on an angle. Yep, and it's coming up on my phone saying that this is the coined website, and so I'm going to sign into that. So it's sending it out at a few kilobits a second. And once it's done that, I'm logged in. So, yeah, that's... <laughs> so, yeah, the benefits of this are you've got the ability of having an out-of-band authentication. You can log in via an untrusted computer because I didn't enter my password into the system. Obviously, you've got a session that's on that computer, but if you were through HTTPS, then you've got um, some a reasonable security around that. Uh, there's no third parties that this is getting sent between. It's just um, directly via an HTTPS channel through to the same server that you're logging into. Um, you're not technically, I'm actually, that was an example where I've got a user that's tied to that data, but you could do it just with the Bitcoin ID and not store anything, so you could just have anonymous data. And so it's resistant to brute force attacks, you've got no passwords, um, yeah. So there are some dangers in that you, you've got to protect your keys, but hopefully if you've got a Bitcoin wallet on your phone or a Bitcoin wallet in general, you're keeping backups and taking general security methods. Um, you've also got to worry about man-in-the-middle attacks, making sure that when you sign in, you're actually signing into the website that you think you are, otherwise you could get in trouble. And, um, yeah, there's no way to, in, in the protocol, there's no way to revoke authentication. So you could do that via back-channel ways if you have uh, email One or minute. phone number. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. You can use it, for example, like I just did, as website authentication. You'd probably only do that in the Bitcoin industry at the moment. It's a pretty small market. But, yeah, something like this technology you could use for website authentication. Two-factor authentication could be a possibility, or even something like door access control for a lockers or a hotel or something like that. So yeah, that's 
bit ID, there's a Python implementation, there's a demo you can try out yourself at that bitcoin.blue, and there's some also some other similar implementations called bitauth and squirrel, so yeah, thanks. I do like it when things go slightly under time so we can get through to our overflow talks as well. We're not quite up to those yet. On deck on this side we have Amy Marie, and over to my left uh, we have um, Zhuan Yi Chu, who's going to be telling us about more stuff you probably didn't know about and something that people in Sydney really should know about. Let's start. All right, so who's here, who's here from Sydney? Cool. This has got nothing to do, what I'm going to show has got nothing to do with whether you're from Sydney or not. So, um, right. over here, I've just entered the Python 3 REPL. Let's see what underscore returns. Okay, maybe we'll just say, um, hello. And now what underscore returns? So basically underscore returns the uh, last evaluated um, value in case you guys didn't know that. So that's number one. Number two, um, I was told that um, I, did, I, I didn't do my best in making Python like Haskell. So I'm gonna show you something that makes Python more like Haskell. X and um, axis, you know. So what is x? Oops, x is the first value and x is the remaining value. That's number two. The third thing, I like um, programs that are easy to reason about. So um, let's say last, and we create something called a slice and we'll say negative one, none, none. Uh, L is this, and if I want the last um, item, there you go, perfectly readable, understandable code. Now, to the part where we talk about Sydney. If you're from Sydney, there is Sydney Python, first Thursdays every month, and at last it starts at 6 p.m. See you there. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, on deck to my left will be uh, Reese Ellsmore. But next, we have uh, Amy Marie telling us about cyber terrorism or, or terrible code, which will kill you first. Thank you. <laughs> Good Try evening, passengers. On. We are recovering from a network connectivity issue this morning and restoring regular flight operations. United Airlines, 8th of July, 2015, 400,000 passengers grounded. In our hyperconnected modern world, I'm going to ask you what is more of a threat and which will kill you sooner, cyber terrorism or terrible code? Terrible code. In 1980, NORAD reported that the US was under missile attack. The problem was actually a faulty circuit. No one actually factored that into the code. In 1983, the Soviet Union early warning system malfunctioned and erroneously reported incoming US missiles. We are very lucky and fortunate the officer in charge decided to follow his gut feelings and think it was a false alarm, potentially avoiding World War III. 1985, Therac 25 radiation therapy machine delivered a high power electron beam with 100 times the intended dose of radiation, delivering a lethal dose of beta radiation. 1991, Gulf War Patriot missile system software had a delay bug. The delay bug allowed the Iraqi missile to come in. 28 people were killed, 100 plus injured. 1994, Scotland, Chinook, Chinook <laughs> helicopter crashed and killed all 29 passengers. Initially, the pilot was blamed, but it was actually terrible code. 2000, radiation therapy planning software delivered different doses depending on the order in which the data was entered. Five people were killed and potentially 21. 2003, a race condition bug causes a blackout across eight US states and Canada, affecting 50 million people. 2003, computer software blunder at St. Mary's Mer Mercy Medical Center in Grand Rapids, Michigan, cost the lives of 8,500 patients. Well, on paper anyway, they were actually alive. <laughs> So we can see just from, the, just from the small bugs that I've noted, we see that the real deaths by terrible code is 78. We had a false deaths reported 8,500. So far, no deaths by cyber terrorism. Software will eat the world, claimed Mark Anderson in the Wall Street Journal in August 
2011. As software eats the world, quality of code becomes not just important, but it is a necessity. It is a necessity because we are not talking about websites going down, we are talking about human lives here. In the olden days, at least my olden days, <laughs> I'm older than you think. In the olden days, infrastructure was built to have 99.999999999999 uptime. Modern containers and microservices architecture allows us to design infrastructure for failure. We are now looking at our infrastructure and going, it's going to fail. We need to architect our software for failure. We need to accommodate for failures. Software bugs should not be taking down systems. We need fault-tolerant code design patterns. There are human lives at stake here. So how do we solve this? Well, I'm going to put this out as a problem, and I'm putting this out as this is our number one problem in the software programming world. And what's going to help us? Well, education is the key. And you know what part of education is? It is admitting that we don't know everything. It is asking for help. It is learning from each other. It is doing test-driven development. And we always talk about continuous integration, continuous development, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to say we need continuous quality control. We need to build our checks into our release cycles. Thank you. Who here is excited to be a programmer? Yeah! I love not killing people. Okay, on this side of the, uh, of the room we have uh, Roman Juice, so if you can come and set up. And in the meantime, we have Reese Elsmore, who is going to be telling us all about what Postgres can teach us about JavaScript. Let's go. Woo! Hey, how you doing? Um, can I get everyone to do a collective R for my new puppy? Aww. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> so anyway, Postgres has a lot of extensions. You can talk to Git, uh, you can make HTTP requests, you can talk to Twitter, so select star from Twitter. Uh, you, can also, you can also do JavaScript. So I'm going to give some examples as to what Postgres can teach us about JavaScript. Uh, First of all, let's find out the type of not a number. That's N-A-N. So if we select from this function that I've created, we can see that not a number is a number. <laughs> OK, that makes sense. What? <laughs> what about the type of null? If we have a look at the type of null, we can see that it is obviously a uh, object. Hmm, that's a bit strange. So that must mean that null is an instance of object, right? or a class, so let's have a look at that, and we can see that it's not. <laughs> Obviously, this will make sense. What about 0 0.1 plus 0 0.3? Obviously, it's going to equal 0. Oh, sorry, 0 0.2. Obviously, it's going to be 0 0.3. So let's select that to have a look, and we can see that it is obviously not. OK, this is not starting to make sense. What about if we declare a var of 0 and see if it's equal to false? It shouldn't be. Well, it is. OK, this obviously isn't looking useful. Empty array plus empty array in Python, that's an empty array. In JavaScript, it should be the same. And it's not. Obviously, this is going to throw us back a division by zero error, same as the array error that we just saw, and we can see that it does not. <laughs> OK. Obviously, this will make sense. If we just want to return true and evaluate it, we can have a look and see that it returns nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, PLV8 is kind of useless in JavaScript, seeing, uh, seeing all those examples there. But if you want to come along to my talk tomorrow at 1.40, I'll be uh, talking about subjects like this, and there will be no JavaScript featured. Chris, how long do I have left? Two minutes, two minutes 40 seconds. Well, let's just have a look at your face for the next two minutes and 40 seconds. I'd uh, like to thank Microsoft for that fantastic photo. No, really. Um, OK, on the, uh, on the left-hand side, once Reese unplugs his laptop, uh, we have Quentin Lovett. And on this side over here, we have Roman Juist, who's going to be telling us about uh, ZC dot build out for repeatable builds. Let's start.
Okay. Um, I haven't prepared any, any slides. I will have to do this sort of straight off the bat. Um, basically, this talk is dedicated to all uh, package maintainers who develop on packages which are a bit more complex than just being installable by pip. Uh, and I'm especially talking about contributors um, who need more than just like three steps to create um, a sandbox, a development sandbox. And all this is um, perhaps uh, for you if you use ZC Buildout. So what it does. What I have here is a simple Python package. Um, two additional um, files in there, that is a buildout.cfg. It's a simple any config file. And uh, a bootstrap. Uh, you run that bootstrap. And it bootstrap ZC buildout. And um, you run bin, bin buildout. And uh, it configures. Um, it configures your program, it creates um, additional console scripts, and that is all driven by the configuration file. If you know Ansible, then you might know uh, Ansible is all uh, split up by tasks, and build out is basically um, split up by recipes and parts. The parts are being defined at the top, and these are sequentially um, executed. Each recipe is doing its dedicated step, and each step can install, uninstall, and um, uh, do something additionally. I um, can't remember, but that's basically the crux. So what, it, what you can basically do, I've just run bin build out, and now I can run my tests. Um, I can, I can run coverage analysis. I can build my documentation. And if you have contributors, then that is really helpful for them because they can instantly hack on the code, run their tests, uh, create coverage analysis, change the documentation, and basically uh, uh, send a pull request. Um, if you are more interested in using ZC Buildout, uh, PyPy page, um, buildout.org. I'm Roman Juiced. If you want to learn more about Buildout, talk to me. Come to my talk tomorrow about program slice and how to build a slicer. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Well, the good news is we still, we've still we got through our scheduled talks, but we still have uh, two overflows, and we've actually got time to get through them. So up first, we have Quentin Lovett, who's going to be telling us about uh, building robots. On this side on deck, we have Hawkey. So if uh, you can set up, that would be fantastic as well. Let's start. Hi, my name is Quentin Lovett, and I build robots for fun. At school, we have a robotics club. We build robots out of LEGO Mindstorms. Uh, we've come first in state three times. Uh, third in nationals and have qualified for the internationals in Qatar this November. So, uh, these photos are a little bit outdated. Uh, these are the robots we use uh, 22 centimeters in diameter, 22 high, and some demos. That's our, uh, that's one of the later robots for attacking. There's sometimes a bit of foul play. <laughs> and the ball, the sides are curved so balls do roll into the goals unexpectedly. Uh, that part of code allows our robot to reverse out of getting stuck with other robots. That gave us quite a distinct advantage as other robots would get stuck on walls and then we could move into goals. Uh, unfortunately, we don't use Python. 
Oh. Instead, we use this. Drag and drop. And still going. Still going. And then each of those blue blocks links in to one of these modules. And more code. And more, and more. But these are completely autonomous. We are not allowed to touch the robots once they're on the field. If we do need to make adjustments, they're taken off for a full minute. Uh, so pretty much our robots find the ball uh, using compass and infrared sensors, direct the ball towards the goal, and score. Thank you. Um, so we have time for one last talk from Hawkey, who is going to be telling us about uh, use PyPy. Really, do it. Time starts now. Okay, sorry, but keynote crashed. Um, okay, so just use PyPy. Hello, I'm Amber Brown. I've been doing talks, etc. This is my Twitter. If you want to yell at me, everyone yell at me. I don't like all of you. You see mm. Python in production. You should rarely just use PyPy. Rarely. Just do it. It's faster, it's better, stronger, etc. Worst so, Daft Punk song ever. Shut up. <laughs> um, OK, so this is, for example, uh, so the yellow uh, orange line is CPython 2.7. The, uh, the blue bars are, is PyPy. Uh, less is better. Now, you see that some of those are dramatically improved. And o on the whole, it's about seven times faster. And it's getting better. This is the graph. Uh, PyPy 2.5, uh, PyPy 2.4, sorry, was released, I think, late last year. So there are still benefits that they're getting. Twisted, for one, shows a real benefit. For example, the blue line is Python 2.6, when we had our old uh, build, uh, build bot. And the uh, orange, line, uh, orange bar is a really old version of PyPy. I'm updating it to have the newer ones. It comes with CFFI, which is better C extensions. You can use cryptography, which is uh, Python's arguably new crypto library to replace PyCrypto. You can u even use PsychoPG2, which runs faster than the C extension version. Py uh, NACL for your uh, Libsodium cri crypto needs. Py open SSL for your SSL needs. Uh, Gevent even works in it. LXML works in it. And SQLite. Now, the JIT knows best. It's very tuned. It will take your code, it will find the hotspots, and it will make them fast. But it doesn't actually know best, because you need to tell it some things. You need to tell it, oh, you need to tell it what you want to do. Now, sim oh, simple is generally fast. If you write what you want to do, rather than trying random performance hacks, which would work in CPython, you will get much, much, much better JIT code because it can understand what you're doing. Things mostly work. This is, for example, Twisted's build bots. There's 53 tests failing out of 3,000, so pretty good. Most of them are th assumptions we've made about garbage collection and uh, dictionary ordering and all things like that, all minor things. PyPy itself, we actually run in production. Uh, Twisted Matrix's web website runs PyPy 2.6, and we can hold a lot more connections open and serve things much faster than just regular CPython. And if you think it's broken, well, at least it's not Jython. <laughs> so please do use PyPy. Please try it out. Please run your applications on it. Please, if you have an open source project, Please add a PyPy builder to your Travis. Just let it fail if it does fail. But it's better to know that it does fail rather than having uh, no one know that. So you can try it. You can see if there's any low-hanging fruit. And you can do some performance tests, use some benchmarks, and see what benefit it can get for you. Thank you. What's up? Uh, we've had 11 fantastic lightning talk presenters. Let's give a round of applause for all of them.